Thank you, Gary. When Gary and I went to work at uh, TI, uh, Gary started working on gallium arsenide solar cells, I think because we thought at the time that it would be a higher efficiency cell than silicon, but the material expense, I don't think that ever really caught on. And in 1958, I started working on low frequency parametric amplifiers for use in long period seismometers. Uh, these two projects served as an introduction to both gallium arsenide and parametric amplifiers. In 1959, TI had a need for low noise parametric amplifiers for X-band. So I had worked on the long period seismometers down below audio frequency, but they put me on the X-band project. And uh, the high electron mobility of gallium arsenide made it the material of choice for these high frequency reactor diodes. And Gary Pittman and I were teamed up and assigned the task of implementing gallium arsenide X-band variactor diodes. About this time, our boss, Bob Pritchard, came back from the device research conference with a re report about the Isaki diode. And uh, after hearing this report, Gary dug down in his 50 milliliter beaker of reject varactors and found four or five Isaki diodes. We'd been throwing them away as <laughs> as rejects. We didn't know they had any uh, potential about you. Gary Pittman had many innovative process technology developments, gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide phosphide. Uh, he made significant contributions to many U.S. Air Force contracts. And these materials were used in the manufacture of LEDs, reactor diodes, and tunnel diodes. Then uh, Gary and I both left TI and joined Spectronics, uh, which was acquired by Honeywell. And he continued his work as vice president for manufacturing at Spectronics and director of military business at Honeywell Optoelectronics. And during the latter part of his uh, career at Honeywell, he attended a quality seminar led by W. Edwards Deming, and this gave him the inspiration to lead the improvement of Honeywell's quality programs and later led him to retire from Honeywell and embark on a new career as a consultant for quality system improvements. The Galton Institute in London published Gary Pittman's book on Sir Francis Galton, the developer of modern statistical methods, and he uh, has lectured and conducted seminars throughout the United States and Mexico and London on statistical process control. The De Goya Library now houses Pitt Pittman's collection of Galton's materials, the finest in the U.S. <laughs> Gary and I are co-inventors of the light emitting diode, the infrared light emitting diode, and numerous other inventions. He passed away in 2013. He was to have received the honorary doctorate from SMU, uh, but that degree is not awarded posthumously, and he died before he could receive it. So I got the honorary PhD from SMU, and Gary didn't. <laughs> but uh, he, he, he died before it could be awarded. Uh, in addition to co-inventing the light emitting diode, uh, with me, he was co-inventor with Nobel Prize winner Jack Hilby, also on some patents, and I'll talk some more about those in a minute. Uh, He left TI and went to Spectronics at the same time I did. Uh, and as far as technical achievements, he received the Lazenby Outstanding Alumnus Award from the SMU Chemistry Department, the SMU Distinguished Alumni Award, and was scheduled to receive the honorary doctorate in May of 2014. Now, when you're working on an emerging technology, you need to be very careful and pay attention to what's going on. And you need to be careful of the advice from the existing technical establishment because sometimes their advice is not very good. The theoreticians will often tell you why your idea won't work. And then if you prove experimentally that the new concept is valid, the same people will publish 
papers on it. So <laughs> you need to keep your eyes open and uh, pay attention to what's going on. Uh, Harry and I had the idea for a laser diode. Now this would have not been a practical device. Uh, the way we had it, we had the cleaved in mirrors on the 110 surfaces on Gallium Marcinide for the mirrors on, on the laser, but uh, I don't know how we'd ever gotten the bias on it if we tried to build it that way and it would have had a threshold of many amps <laughs> if we had tried to build it. So uh, we didn't ever try that. We gave up on this idea. Uh, we had a flawed, flawed model and the flawed advice uh, from our compatriots in uh, the central research at TI said the laser diode wouldn't work, so we didn't uh, pursue it. However, an experiment was performed to test the model. Uh, we thought something was going on in these gallium arsenide P injunctions, particularly the tunnel diodes. We thought it might be in the valley region, but we made a structure with a tunnel diode. Well, <laughs> uh, the tunnel, this is a zinc diffused P layer in a 10 dot alloy and made a tunnel diode on a semi insulating gallium arsenide substrate. And sure enough, when we forward past the tunnel diode, the resistance changed between the two contacts on the semi-insulating substrate. So we knew something was going on uh, in these tunnel diodes. And we thought it might be emitting light. Gary and I were building and selling gallium arsenide reactors and tunnel diodes. We got access to an hour microscope that was brought in to TI by a Japanese firm and we took some of the reactor diodes and tunnel diodes with batteries and clip leads up to this IR microscope and forward biased them and sure enough they were all emitting infrared light. Uh, the LED was not the purpose of this project, it just happened. We were building reactors and tunnel diodes, but we found out they emitted light and filed a patent on it. And uh, the patent finally issued in 1966 for the gallium arsenide infrared LED. For this patent, uh, here's some of the, the, the pictures out of the patent. For this patent, TI paid us a dollar. That was their policy at the time. I had a good friend at TI, was one that recruited me out of A&M. In fact, we had gone through A&M together in our undergraduate. And uh, they came to him one day to sign a patent application. He said, no, I'm not going to sign. He said, why? He said, I want my dollar. He said, oh, that's just a technicality. And he said, no, no dollar, no sign. So the patent attorney took a dollar out of his own pocket and paid him a dollar. So he had signed the patent application. After that, the TI patent attorneys carried around a stack of brand new $1 bills with them everywhere they went to get people to sign the patent applications. The man that invented the blue LED a couple of years ago got the Nobel Prize. I got a dollar, but you couldn't <laughs> see mine. <laughs> now the uh, infrared LEDs are still used when you use your channel changer on your TV. That's an infrared LED in there. You can't see it, but it shines the light on the, on the pickup and changes the channel on your TV set. So they're still in use today. This is a picture of Gary. Uh, oh, hit the wrong button again. Here's some of Gary's patents. That uh, radiant diode is number one. And uh, he has a patent number three there with Jack be the Nobel Prize winner at TI. Uh, and patent number five also with Jack Kilby. And a process for the fabrication of light emitting semiconductor diodes with George Henderson and Gary Pittman, number six. Here's me kind of what I looked like back then. <laughs> I've changed a little over the years. This is a 
excerpt from the Lemnison <coughs> web page and shows the head LEDs that were being made at the time. TI had already entered the optoelectronic component market with phototransistors. These detectors were used by IBM and others for reading the holes and punch cards. Uh, the light source that we used was a tungsten ribbon lamp used with a fiber bundle to distribute the light to the 12 rows of holes in the IBM card. We replaced the tungsten ribbon lamp and the fiber bundle with 12 LEDs, our LEDs, and one of the first products that used this was the IBM 059 card verifier. The reliability problem uh, displayed by the tunnel diode, the tunnel diodes degraded when you forward bias them. And this reliability problem also affected the LED. When biased in the forward direction, at constant current, the light output of the LED decreased with time. Uh, this led us to do extensive testing on the LED where we saw a dark line defects. This is a picture of a Langer Galley Marcinide diode junction. And after you ran it for a while, these dark line defects started at the perimeter of the junction and propagated into the bulk along crystallographic planes and were made up of non radiative recombination centers that caused the current to go up. The material between the dark lines still had the same efficiency it had before, but it, you got the same amount of light at a higher current because you had to supply the current to all the dark line defects that were there. This led me to develop my law of light emitters. It says that everything that emits light has only so many photons in it and how long it lasts depends on how fast you let them out. <laughs> Fortunately, that number of photons is not a universal constant. In 1964, at TI and the Semiconductor Research and Development Department, I happened to be heading both the MOS branch and the Opto branch at SRDL. Gary was building the gallium arsenide phosphide three by five red LED arrays. And the TI marketing department wanted to put a red LED display in the IEEE booth at the IEEE show that year. And uh, we needed a way to drive, they were gonna have several digits and some of them were just gonna have a number on them, but the last digit they wanted to be cycling through zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, over and over and over and over. So we needed some way to drive that 15 element LED array. And the result was US patent 3541543 for the MOS read-only memory. We didn't know we were inventing the read-only memory. <laughs> we thought we were coming up with something to drive an LED display for the IEEE booth. But uh, the TI patent department filed on it and Bob Crawford and I were the co-inventors. And uh, th this is sort of a schematic of the Circuit. The binary coded decimal input was here at the bottom and the 15 outputs to drive the LEDs were around the top part of the chip. Here's the 15 element display and the leads that were on for the numbers, zero through nine. Here's a Picture of the chip. Now, in 1964, I was also working on linear amplifier designs for optical receivers. And they were slow because they were saturating. When you forward bias the collector based diode, you store charge in the silicon transistor, the silicon bipolar transistor. So we started buying HP hot carrier diodes and putting them across the collector base junction to hold the junction out of. Saturation. That's when we found out that the silicon hotkey diodes had a lower forward drop than the silicon PN junction. So they would protect the junction and no minority carry charge storage would result under forward bias. So these uh, linear amplifier designs for optical receivers suddenly weren't limited by the saturation of the input stage. We filed a patent on that, and Schottky clamped logic circuits was the result. That 
wasn't the intent again uh, of what we were doing, but uh, you need to keep your eyes open and pay attention to what's going on because this turned out to be a very important patent for TI. The aluminum contact system we used in the beginning was not, didn't make very reliable or predictable Schottky diodes. But uh, when the platinum silicide Schottky diodes were developed, in about 1965 it resulted in transistor-transistor logic, TTL, with Schottky clamps. And that was the main logic family for a long time before uh, uh, MOS took over all that. That uh, patent was filed in 1964 and finally issued in 1969. We put the Schottky diode across the collector base junction of the bipolar transistor to hold it out of saturation. Fred Streeter feels that I was partially responsible for incels for Intel's success. Intel's first product was Schottky bipolar TTL logic circuits. However, TI enforced my <laughs> patent and Intel went into CMOS <laughs> and they've been successful ever since. <laughs> well, I don't know if I can indirectly take credit for that or not. <laughs> it turned out the technology worked just beautifully better than anyone could have expected. It worked so well that competitors were able to copy it rapidly even though our patent predated when they started working on it. Uh, that technology was too easy, so we chose another technology for assembling a lot of memory chips in one package. Now, I retired from Honeywell, who had acquired Spectronics, and uh, they sold the Honeywell Opto division to Finisar. And Finisar hired me back half time as a consultant, and I worked for them till last year. Uh, since I was only working half time, I didn't have any retirement benefits from Finisar, but when they quit uh, paying me, I quit going to work. Uh, <laughs> that uh, seemed to make sense, but uh, uh, so I'm finally retired. <laughs> but uh, at Spectronics and Honeywell Opto Division and Finisar, the bulk of the patents that I have is on vertical cavity surface emitting laser diodes, the Vixel. This geometry lends itself to conventional semiconductor manufacturing, packaging, and testing. Uh, it's used not for long haul fiber optic communication, but it's used in all the large server networks at Google and places like that for uh, most of the links that use the Vixel are less than 300 meters long. And it uses the graded index uh, standard optical fiber. And the links between these servers is usually at 100 gigabits. And that's 10, 10 gigabit channels originally. But now uh, Finisar has gotten the pixels up to 25 gigabits so they can do the 100 gigabit gigabit data rate with 425 gig, gig pixel channels where they modulate the light directly by modulating the current through the pixel. It doesn't take an external modulator. Uh, you just change the current and change the light output. This is a picture of an early pixel with the end mirror, the three quantum welds in the middle for the active layers and the P mirror on top and the light comes out the top surface. A later version of the Vixel looks something like this, uh, where it has a mesa for the P mirror. Now, as I said, the things that affect the LED also affect the Vixel. But this is a, sort of a 
history of the improvement of the life expectancy of the Vixel up through 2012. I don't have any more data um, more recent than this, but uh, at end of the eighth hours, that would be about 10,000 years, and you can see that only 5% of the Vixels have failed in the end of the eighth hour. So they're getting pretty reliable. <laughs> New technologies depend on the accumulated effort of many scientists and engineers from around the world. This is clearly true for the LED, the MOS-ROM, the Schottky bipolar, and the Vixel. And all of these developments depended on the intentional or unintentional cooperation and contribution of many different people. I couldn't have done any of this at home in my garage. Uh, TI ended up paying a lot more than one dollar for patents, but uh, I don't get any royalties off the patents that I have. They all belong to the company I work for because I couldn't have done it without their technology. Uh, there are no technological secrets. New developments have their place in time and will happen when the technology allows it. And many of the most important new developments do not result from specifically directed development programs. So keep your eyes open. You have to be in the right place at the right time. Knowledge helps. The emergence and successful exploitation of any new technology requires these three levels of feasibility. Conceptual feasibility, technical, and economic feasibility. To achieve economic feasibility, a new technology must fulfill a perceived need. And that's it. This is the, my version of the reenactment of the great race between the train and the Model T Ford. The steam locomotive train and the Model T Ford. Thank <laughs> you.